What up? Yeah, I'm not worried about the air meat. You know, that's kind of like CNN. It's going to be on for days. <laughs> Oh, sure. Let me uh, let me put that in to this here chat. There you go, Michael Honey. Check. So, guys, um, we're not gonna be doing. Uh, well, I mean, we're obviously going live, but. Uh, my uh, my goal today, it's not for, like, entertainment. It might not even be educational, because Lord knows I'm probably doing... Uh, <laughs> thanks, Victor. <laughs> um, what I'm doing is uh, my Dynam P47, I am converting over to a panning first-person view system. Uh, so I've got the battery um, tray, the cockpit area, and I've already, like, you know, made a hole, made a hole in the bottom, see? Made a hole in the bottom, see? Um, and that's where my panning servo is going to go. And that servo is going to be driven by the iX12 and my goggles, which have head tracking. So as I move my head from side to side, the goggles will move the camera from side to side. But obviously, this thing is not outfitted for uh, the FPV components, uh, such as the video transmitter and the antenna and the camera itself, uh, which is all, you know, part of this little thing here so what i'm going to be doing is uh cracking open fusion 360 here in a little bit which is a uh, very powerful uh, 3d design tool um, or model design tool and we're going to create um, some 3d models um, and convert those into stl files that i can output to a 3d printer or to the slicer software so we can 3d print a mount and a um, a mount and kind of a servo horn that will mount this camera as well as uh, put the the VTX which is this little that little contraption that that is our VTX board or our video transmitter so mount that board to the back of the seat right there. So we're gonna make a little plastic piece that'll raise that up off the foam and allow air to get in there uh, to cool that off. As well as mount the antenna right about here and it will stick up out of the back of the canopy and that's okay. I just want it to be hard mounted to something. So we're gonna make a little piece that will go right there and hold that antenna up. Uh, we're gonna make another piece that will lift this up off the foam a little bit and allow some ventilation air uh, to get up under it. And, you know, depending on how late it gets during this process, we'll go ahead and also make the mount that the servo, uh, that, that will mount to, uh, or like we're just gonna super glue it to a servo horn uh, that will move the camera you know, and I don't know if you can see the camera right there that will move the camera back and forth uh, with the head tracking on the goggles so we get a more immersive uh, FPV situation and we can look out over the wings while we're flying and things like that. So it should be cool. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and uh, fire up Fusion 360 here in a little bit. Um, and, you know, it's it's more for people to just kind of peek in and and see what I'm doing. Uh, Robert Ortlep, this VTX is freaking small. Uh, this is an iFlight, uh, what is this? I think it's called the Microforce. Yeah, the iFlight Success Microforce. 
And let me measure this. I got my my handy dandy caliper since we're gonna be doing some 3D design here. I like for it to be as accurate as I can. Uh, so this is 15 millimeters. Yeah, it's like 15 by 14 millimeters, um, which is just tiny. And it's got some uh, like solder pads here on the side, and I think the thing weighs like 1.9 grams or something. I mean, it, it adds hardly any weight. It's a 300 milliwatt uh, VTX, so it's a lot stronger than, you know, say most of the VTXs that you get that are part of like an all-in-one camera package, which is why I don't do those. Um, you know, there's a lot of all-in-one cameras out there that that have a VTX built into them. Um, I went this way because a lot of those are like 25 milliwatt, and you just start getting a lot of breakup, uh, especially if you fly a little further away or you accidentally go behind a tree or whatever. Uh, this will allow me, you know, to get a much stronger signal and... I can use whatever antenna I want, where a lot of those all-in-one camera um, video transmitters have like a built-in or a soldered-on dipole antenna, which is a piece of crap. I'd rather have a polarized antenna, like you see here, uh, and I can get that up off the surface of the airplane. A lot of those smaller, you know, all-in-one units were intended for like micro drones, and with this one, or micro quads, I can stick this thing anywhere I want, have a separate camera, and you know get this up and out of the way to get it cooled down. So this is a better scenario for me, um, you know, rather than having a 25 milliwatt VTX built into the camera, I get to pick, you know, I get to pick my camera quality. So I've got a Cadex Ant, uh, and this is a 1200 vertical lines of resolution it's still an analog camera but it's a uh, you know 1200 lines of resolution which is great um i've got a 300 milliwatt vtx and all of this stuff uh, hardly weighs anything you know the the amount of of room that i'm uh, you know using is very small and to some degree it's modular you know this is this is everything this stuff and a servo is everything that goes in the airplane for the setup. Um, so I dig it. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and open up Fusion 360 and start working on the first part that I'm going to make for this, which will be the VTX mount. Um, and let's go ahead and get cracking. Nope, no tap dancing. <laughs> and uh, first I'll move the chat over to the other window because I, if, if you guys have questions kind of during the process, I don't want to miss out on those because, you know, I want to see what y'all are asking, kind of. <laughs> All right, we got the chat moved over. Uh oh. Do, do, do. We'll get Fusion 360 open. We need that to do what we're doing today. And, uh, and once all this stuff is opened up, we'll go ahead and shift over to the screen where you guys can see what I'm doing in Fusion 360, you know, kind of designing. And and uh, I'll leave my little, um, my window uh, in the corner so you can kind of, you know, see what I'm doing at times when there's pauses. Um, a lot of times what I will do is... Um, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, of measuring things over and over and over and over again. So, uh, you know, I'll be sitting here with my calipers, 
you know, measuring the part and making sure that that it's exactly how I want it to be. Um, and because on the airplane, uh, everywhere where a part is going to mount is an area that I'm going to have to modify the foam anyway. I'm not too worried about those measurements, but I am worried about, you know, the, the dimensions of the cradle that I create for the VTX to sit in. And I'm worried about the, you know, the dimensions of, you know, the hole that's going to go into the print that the, uh, that the SMA connector, uh, which is right here, you know, that, that little SMA connector needs to go up into a little block and stick out at about a, you know, so if that's 90, it needs to come out at about a 70 degree, 70 a degree angle I want it canted back a little bit um, so I'll be doing a lot of measuring and things like that with um, with these guys so um, it's not that's just the light glare uh, channel 6 <coughs> mr. flaps that is just light glare off of the screen. So I'm getting logged into uh, my Fusion 360 account here. Give me just a second. Uh oh. Did I forget my Autodesk login? Uh oh. <laughs> All right, so we'll go ahead and head on over here to All right. All right, so for those of you guys that uh, are not familiar with what we're doing or joined in late, I, I don't think that there's like more people watching. If there are, God bless you. Uh oh. I had some kind of weird error pop up. All right, so it looks like Fusion 360 got an update. Hopefully we don't run into anything that makes it difficult to use. Um, so... The um, Fusion 360 interface is really easy to use, and what we're going to be doing is creating some very kind of simple parts anyway, so... Um, uh, you know, a lot of this is going to be based on like design constraints that that come from you know the parts that we're using, um, and and the size of you know individual walls and things like that that I want to make and standoffs. Um, so I am going to. I'm going to take a look here and get, you know, those dimensions once again. So it's 15, 15.3, we'll call it, yeah, we'll probably do like 15 and a half. And 14. And we want a spot for the wires on the back because it's going to be sitting like this. And we want some spot for the wires on the front of the VTX to come out of the little cradle that we're going to make. All right. So... It's going to sit like this. It's going to be I want 
the total. Ought to be about 17, and that's 15. So we're going to make a square that is 17 and a half. And we're just going to kind of build up on top of that. So we're going to create a sketch on this bottom plane. We're going to start with a center rectangle. And let's see. One set of dimensions will be... So this will be side to side. <laughs> yep, that's right about fourteen point six. We'll call it fifteen. And we hit tab to go to the other dimension. This is going to be our width. And that's 15.34. We'll call that 16. I, had to, I like to add about a half a millimeter. Um, it, you know, it doesn't need to be perfect. It does need to fit in there. I leave about a half a millimeter, uh, and that gives me some space for the part to... You know, at least some tolerances because FDM printing is not like an exact science. Uh, so this will be able to move around a little bit and get a better seat uh, once I have the the mount built up. So you measure that one more time here. Yep, so we'll just do it easy like. So the 15 by 16 square that we, uh, well, it's not a square because that would suggest that all sides are equal, right? Um, so it's 15 by 16. And we're going to go ahead and uh, this will basically be the 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 base that we want uh, everything to sit on, um, you know. But we also want some airflow to get under there. So, and I'll show you how we're going to address that here in just a second. So, the first thing that we'll do so we can get like a usable part here is um, we're going to extrude this square. Uh, which in order to do that we have to finish the sketch get our blue part extrude it and we're going to come up by let's see that's one millimeter we're going to have about one millimeter walls too we're going to come up about three millimeters on that base and and we'll get into the whys here in just a second so now we've got uh oh Now we've got a, you know, a small square uh, that the VTX will sit right on top of. Now the other, you know, the one of the big reasons that I'm doing this is because I want the VTX to be able to have, you know, to be able to breathe, right? I need it to... Um, And that's actually going to be, uh-oh. The long side of it. So we're going to go ahead and look at that sketch again. Well... <laughs> I think I think I made this dimension the wide 
dimension. I'm pretty sure I did. Like this, this is going to be the front, as the the name would suggest. Like this, this is the front, and the because if I I'm going to add like some louvers in here. So anyway, um, and the way that we're going to do that is on here we're going to create another sketch on this face and what i want to do is First, we're going to do some construction lines because I want to find out like exactly where the middle is um, and it doesn't quite tell you. So I'm going to make a couple of construction lines that cross over and show us right where the middle uh, is. <clears throat> and then we're also going to take Some more construction lines. And, you know, because I know I want that wall to be about one millimeter. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to cut some channels through here. So. I'm going to do a construction rectangle. Uh oh, that's not what I want. I want that to be one millimeter. I'm going to do another construction rectangle here. On this side. That is also three by one. We know that we've got about one millimeter of material on the sides that's going to hold it up. And then we're going to do, we're basically going to start drawing from there uh, little, little grooves in the, into this. And you'll see, uh, you'll kind of see that play out here. Um, we'll take that off of construction lines. So, and we're going to go one millimeter by two millimeters deep. So that'll be two by one. Thought I turned off construction lines. Jerk. All right. And then we're going to do another two by one rectangle here, two by one. And it's kind of a pain in the butt the way that I do this, but it makes sense to me. Um, and yeah, that's how we're going to do that. I mean, what difference does it make? It's not going to hurt it. Right. So we're basically going to do two by one all the way across. Okay. What the, is going on here? Two by one. 
and this will make sense here in just a second. I hope. <laughs> Otherwise, I just look like an idiot. Uh, Robert Ortlip, I will be using um, I mean, it's going to be in the sun. I'm probably going to use PETG and the brand I use is the Inland PETG that you can find at Micro Center. We've got a Micro Center a local to us here and they are great. Okay, so now we've got this whole thing kind of loaded up with these two by one inch or two millimeter by one millimeter louvers. So we're going to finish the sketch here and uh, hopefully this will make sense what I'm doing. So every other one of these squares we're going to highlight. And you know what, we'll skip that one. We'll do this one on the end. And we'll have a double wide vent right in the center. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna extrude each one of those back this way. And we're going to use that extrude tool to cut those away. So now what I've got is that same base, um, you know, that we had made before. I've got, yes, uh, there probably is a pattern option. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's still a lot of stuff that I have to learn about Fusion 360. Um, and th there probably is a pattern option. I just don't know. I don't know how to use it yet. Um, th this is a, a massively um, powerful tool, and I'm I'm very much still learning. So. That's what we got so far, and yes, absolutely, the uh, a 300 milliwatt uh, VTX is going to get hot. Uh, this thing is, you know, what we're what I'm making here is a little piece that is going to go. Um, that this little VTX, that little tiny thing, is going to sit on top of. Um, now the heat shield will go down, so it won't be as hot as, you know as it could be, but yes, at 300 milliwatts, that thing is still, um, is still going to absolutely be hot as hell. So from here, uh, I want to make like some little walls because this is basically the interior section of, um, uh, of this. Uh, and you know, this bottom piece is basically going to glue to the back of the seat. And and speaking of gluing to the back of the seat, I want a little lip on the bottom. And and we'll do that here in a second. So the first thing I want to do is uh, the sidewalls here. We're actually going to extrude those out this way by another millimeter. Whoop, whoop. There we go. And we'll do the same thing on the other side. Uh-oh. Did that? Well, that didn't work. <laughs> We're going to come out by one millimeter. Enter. And on this side, we're going to come out by one millimeter. I could just hit the... Ugh. 
the E button and be done with it, it would be a lot easier. All right, so we've got our extrusions there. So we're going to come up. Let's look at the bottom. Well, that stinks. So we're just going to draw a new sketch on the top. You know, so right there where we um, just drew those or just extruded the parts um, here, we're going to extend that last millimeter up by a little bit. So we're going to create. We're going to create a sketch here and we're going to draw that out. One millimeter is perfect. Um, Finish that sketch and then we'll create another one on this side. And we're going to make that one by fifteen as well. All right. And then we're going to take those two pieces and raise them up by one millimeter. Uh oh. First, we gotta finish that sketch. Raise that up. Oh, you know what? We're gonna raise it up by the full thickness of the VTS. The full thickness. <laughs> so, however tall the uh, the VTX is on the side, that's how far we're gonna bring that up, which is four point. Three. Let's call it four and a half. So we're going to raise that side wall up by four point five. All right. So what we have here now is a piece that that VTX is going to sit inside of. Um, and on the, you know, so it will sit in there and it will be prevented from moving side to side, you know, by these uh, walls here, which are four and a half millimeters tall. The heat spreader will sit on top of these little grooves, which have some air channels that will allow you know, some air, um, you know, because as this thing sits, there's gonna be an opening in the canopy that's gonna allow air to go through there, which will be able to flow right uh, through those holes and provide plenty of cooling air uh, for that VTX. And the last thing that I wanna do, which is, uh, you know what, I'm not gonna do it. I, I was gonna make a little lip um, that goes like right here um, for the bottom um, to just kind of hold it up against the seat but I'm not going to um, I'm not going to mess with it I'm going to leave it the way that it sits and I am pretty happy with this, um, you know, for the VTX mount. Now, when I'm initially designing these, uh, and I don't put a lot of effort into making them look pretty, 
Um, <laughs> so, you know, because this isn't a, a commercial product, I'm not that concerned about fillets and, and chamfers and things like that and making it look uh, like something that I want to, you know, sell. Uh, it's it's far more Spartan and utilitarian in nature, so I just leave it like this, and it's actually a little easier for the printer to just not mess with any of that stuff. So this is what I will end up sending to the printer, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and save this guy, and this will be i flight what's this thing called again micro force yes and we will call this project P forty seven FPB and that's where we will save this. All right, so we've got the um. We've got the mount that we're going to use for the VTX, and the next thing that I'm going to work on is the mount for the antenna, uh, which will be a little more complex, but maybe not. Maybe it'll be easier. So, uh, so that should work for the VTX mount. And next, we'll go up here to new... We've already saved this. We can actually close that out and now we're back to that initial screen. Um, and let's see. And if we wanted to open, we could go to P47. Yeah, we can get back to that old one pretty easy. Um, so to give you guys a little bit of insight, this, this product is Autodesk Fusion 360. Um, and as Robert, um, you know, kind of alluded to, the reason that I use uh, Fusion 360 is because it's it's free for non-commercial use. Uh, so for hobbyists, um, you know, nonprofits, businesses making less than a hundred thousand dollars a year, um, you can get a free license for Fusion 360. Uh, and uh, otherwise you'd have to pay for it and it's it's pretty freaking expensive and uh, you know at, at the time well, once you get to a point where you either have to pay for it where, where you get to that teeter-totter edge of do I want to pay for Fusion 360 or do I want to you know find an alternative um, depending on what you're using Fusion 360 for you'd probably want to go with a different product uh, because SolidWorks, you can do everything that you can do in Fusion 360 in SolidWorks, and SolidWorks has a cheaper monthly fee than Fusion 360 does. So, you know, at least for me, for doing free stuff, uh, I use Fusion 360 to make all these little mounts. So, uh, the next thing that we're going to work on is a mount for this little SMA adapter that attaches to the VTX so you know there's a couple of small constraints there that we want to work with and we're just going to make the bottom of the mount square uh, and we're going to mount it right to this area we're actually going to you know cut some of that off and and glue the uh, the antenna mount Probably right there or right here, you know, somewhere not far behind the seat, right in this area. Um, but I want that mount to be the same width as these two things. 
and that is right at 24 millimeters. So again, for simplicity, I'm going to create a sketch right here, and I'm going to do another uh, square, set a rectangle. It's 24 by 24. All right, so we're just going to make a 24 by 24 square. Easy day, right? Um, and what we need to do is get this, um, you know, the way that this thing sits, we need to get that elevated uh, where the mounting hole is going to have enough room for that cable, you know, to kind of bend. And we want it to tilt back just a little bit. So I need to find out about how tall I need to make this thing. Um... Let's see. Sorry, I'm just doing some measuring right now. Try to you know, get a good feel for where I want all of my different um, things to start here. So we're, where we're gonna start is we're gonna come about one millimeter in. And, so let's go ahead and take this uh, and we're gonna extrude that up. We're gonna make that a two millimeter base. So we're gonna do two millimeter walls on this one. You know, cause it needs to be a little bit tougher. The VTX isn't gonna be getting whipped around or anything. This one is, so we'll go with a little bit tougher walls. And let's see, on top of this guy. So where's the front? Okay, that's the front. Cool. So, we're going to do another sketch on top of there. We're going to do two more. They should be 24 by 2. Come on, bastard. Okay. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a wall that's standing up as tall as I need the entire little contraption to be. Um, So 40 millimeters will give us plenty of room. They're not going to stay that tall, but that's going to give us plenty of room to, uh, to work here. All right. <laughs> no. Over here, we're going to start doing some construction lines because I have an idea of about how tall I need it to be. Um, but we know that that bottom 
that bottom is two millimeters. So we're going to start with that by drawing. Actually, we could just do. Yep, yeah, we're just going to do this. Okay. So we're going to do another sketch over here. We're going to do some construction lines. We're going to draw, you know, just for for reference lines, right? Which is what the construction lines are. They just offer some points of reference for us to go off of. Um, I already looked and I need to be about 15 millimeters high on this side. So I'm going to do another construction rectangle that's about 15 millimeters tall by 24. Not four, 24. Right, so that gets me another line at 15 millimeters high. And then right here is where I want to um, right here is where I want to have my, my, um, my offset where I want that, that, that antenna to kind of sit at an angle. And like I mentioned, I don't want it sitting at like 90. So I don't want to make a perfect box, um, you know, and just sit this right on top of it. I want it to tilt back a little bit. Um, you know, I want it to actually be sitting at about 70 degrees. So at 15 up that, I want to create a line. And let's see, so that's 90, but I think I'm dorking that up. I think I want that line on the other side. I do. So 30, that's too much. And I'm going to make it like 25. Let's call it 27 degrees. I like that angle a little better. No, that's even too much. Oh. All right, so we're going to do another line. Sorry, that one got a little dorked up. Oh, I see what's happening. All right, so the whole point of that was to basically make it where I could take this part of that shape and use that as a cutting tool, right? So, I mean, 
we, we took a long time to get to here, but that's okay. Um, so I'm going to use that to extrude that over and basically chop off that whole top part. Which leaves us with with this piece here. Now, the way that this is going to mount is it's going to mount right to the, you know, right to this area of the airplane. And then it's going to come up. It's going to have a little bit of a tilt to it. And then it's going to... Um... <laughs> nice, Joseph. All right. So basically what we want to do now is we're going to draw another sketch on this piece. And I want to do another, it won't be a two point triangle, I believe. This one will be a three-point triangle. And we want it to be two millimeters thick. Right, just like that. And... Well, So we're gonna do we're, we're gonna do something a little weird here, but it's okay. It it will work. It's kind of cheating, but you know, it'll be all right. So what I want to do is I want this to be the surface that I mount the the top of my SMA connector to for the antenna. Um, so I'm gonna I hate doing it because it's kind of cheap. Um, <clears throat> And I, I would like it to look better than this, but it's it's okay. Uh, we're gonna extrude that across, and we're actually gonna hold on. We're gonna change that to join. We're going to hit OK. Right, and it's going to leave that weird little shape there at the front. And we're going to cheat a little bit to make that work. I'm going to take that and extrude it out a little bit. Um, and hit OK. And then I'm going to take here on the side and we're going to use that to cut it off whoop all right so now you can see that little area where we had that weird uh, angle right there is all fixed and it's all one face now um you know it, it it's I, i'm sure that there's an easier way to do that but that's just how i did it um all right, so now we're going to start working on where I want the... See you, Victor. Now we're going to start working on exactly where I want the, um, the SMA connector to come through. So, you know, we're, we're looking at the top here. And this would be, you know, like the front of the mount. So the wire will go in there and then go 
um, the wire will come in and then go up and out of a hole that uh, that ends up going like right here. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to draw, we're going to create a sketch on that inside piece right here. We're going to draw up some construction lines so we can find where the middle of that piece is. I'm going to do another construction line. <coughs> Let's see. Yep, we'll make the whole body kind of uh, transparent, and when we want to see it again, we can we can bring it up right here. But what I want to do is I want to make a hex uh, area right in the middle that's going to get cut out. Um, And I know that there is a way to do that. Polygon. Okay. So we know where the circuit is. And we're going to take that off of construction. So basically what we're doing is we're going to create an inset uh, using this, uh, this polygon shape. We're going to extrude about whatever the thickness is of this SMA connector here on the bottom. When we create this bridged area, uh -oh. we're going to raise that up by two millimeters, which is perfect. And we want, that's an eight millimeter hex. So we want that eight millimeters. We're going to make it say 8.1. That can't be right. Oh, you know what? Yes, it is. 4.5. Yes. So now, that thing is right where I need it to be. And 
I can go ahead and drop that and the uh oh damn it I didn't want to undo that okay so the next thing I want to do is I want to make a circle around there to create like a relief spot where I can um I have some material on there to work with so we're going to go right back to that center point and we're going to make a circle that stretches out oh, let's say about that much over that hex um And that's good. So that'll be the body that holds that hex area in place um, when the SMA connector goes up in there. You know, so this this little piece right here is going to slide up into there, and that hex piece is going to sit into a relief that's created by the two shapes that we just made. And the last piece that we're going to do is figure out what the diameter is of the actual SMA connector. It's about 5.7, so we're going to call it 6 millimeters. Um, we're going to do another 6 millimeter circle on the inside of here. And right now we're just making a sketch, right? Um, which is fine. Okay. So, now we want to be able to see those bodies again. And, you know, we're just going to kind of take this one area at a time. Um, because the first thing that we want to do is take this and cut it out. Right, so that creates that hole that we were looking for. Where'd my sketch go? Motherfucker? All right. <laughs> Sorry. All right, and we're going to take this and we're going to extrude this in by two millimeters, which is the thickness of the um, that little, you know, kind of flanged area on the uh, the SMA connector. So we're going to extrude that down to create, we're going to go with two millimeters. And what you'll see there is on the inside of that, there is now an area that that, that, that flanged hex, that, that hex flange can go up into. It will seat inside that, that area there. And the rest of the SMA connector will come up through here. And, you know, then we can put our lock ring and our, uh, our nut on there to tighten it up. And because it's got kind of that relieved area underneath it, we can tighten that up and it will, you know, hold it in place. We don't have to have a tool on the bottom side there. So... That was a, another thing that I was trying to consider is being able to hold it in place while I tighten it from the top. Um, and and this will help me get that, um, you know, that retainer nut on the top of the SMA connector much tighter. So that is pretty much this whole part as well. Um, you know, we've got... Uh, let's see. Yep, we've got the top, bottom, sides. Um, it's okay that it's hollow. I want, I want air to be able to go through these things because the the front of the canopy is going to be open, and I want to reduce. <laughs> Even though the canopy is going to be acting like a big ass parachute, I want to reduce the drag as much as possible. So I'm going to have another hole in the back of the canopy where the air's just not getting trapped up in there. It's going to allow it to move through the canopy, I hope, right, in theory. Um, 
and uh, and we'll see how that works. Um, I don't know. All right, so this will be antenna. No. All right. So, um, I mean, that's that's kind of it, fellas. <laughs> I've got the the antenna mount, and I've got the little VTX mount. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, these are saved. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to why does it say antenna mount V1? Hmm. So let me let me open that back up because that seems a little weird. All right. So this is the mount um, for the VTX, where the the small VTX. It's a small little uh, unit right here. It's it's very tiny. Uh, it's like bare circuit board on one side, but I actually need that to be exposed because it's got the button on there. Uh, because I don't have the ability from the transmitter to change the frequency and things like that on this unit for like an airplane. I'm not running like a flight controller or anything. So I have to change the output power and all of that using a little button that is on this side. So it needs to mount upside down. And that's how we're going to do that. Um, I just thought about something. I'm glad that I opened this up because I need to cut a little space out of the front of this thing for the wires to go down the face of it. Okay, so we're going to do a sketch on this, and then we're going to make a construction line. Rectangle. What the hell? We'll have that set. Uh, it's a little janky, but that's all right. Uh, then we'll do another construction line set here that goes in this way and over by 1.8 millimeters. Then... This area is... Eight millimeters. So we're going to come in by two, not by nine. So we're going to change that to a real. There you go. Two, nine. Finish sketch. 
And we're going to take that piece and extrude it up and cut through all of that. And that makes a little relief right there at the front where our wires can hang down the front of the VTX module without, um, you know, without getting bent or anything because I don't want to put any unnecessary stress on the front of the solder joints. So that was that last piece that I forgot on the VTX mount. Um, so all of these now are are um, are ready to go to the printer at this point. So I'm gonna save this. User saved. Um, we'll say wire relief. Because every time you save it, like uh, Fusion 360 has automatic versioning, you know, so it'll make this like a V2, V1.1. You know, I think the first one was like a V0. And, and, you know, if you can see at the top there, it just changed it from iFlight Micro Force VTX Mount V1 to VTX Mount V2 because I made, you know, some changes to the design. So it's doing its automatic versioning, which is cool. Um, but that's, that's all I wanted to change on this guy. Um, and that's, that's kind of it. I know I said that before, but I, I think, I think I'm done with the, uh, you know, with the design of the pieces, which is kind of what I wanted to show, you know, I know that I'm not the, um, uh, you know, like a brilliant 3D designer or anything like that. And these are some very rudimentary pieces. But, um, you know, hopefully that that was able to help somebody. <laughs> um, I, David, yourself, I have printed one spinner and it was an absolute disaster. It like, phew, it flew apart everywhere. And I will never ever do it again. Uh, whatever, whatever I'm trying to save money, time, whatever, by printing my own spinner, it just wasn't worth it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when I printed it, it was PLA and it was terrible. <laughs> So there's there's some things that I will just buy. Um, right. So you know, in this video or in this uh, stream, we were going over uh, the design that I've got for um, it's for a couple of mounting brackets for a project that I'm working on where I'm adding some FPV equipment to a Dynam P47. Um, and, you know, here is the canopy, you know, battery cover for the Dynam P47. And, you know, for those that were kind of following along, um, That that VTX module I'm going to have sitting right on the back of the seat where I've got that little cutaway. Um, but this is a 300 milliwatt, 300 milliwatt video transmitter. And this little bastard gets hot as freaking fire. It gets hot. Um, so I don't want it sitting right there on the phone. I want it to be able to get some airflow to it. So that first piece that you saw, which, um, which was this piece. So that piece there, that's what this is going to mount to. Um, and it's got those louvers in it that are going to create some airflow, uh, because on the bottom of there, there's a little, you know, like a little heat shield. 
It'll allow some airflow to get over that heat shield. So, you know, once it's in there, the VTX will set up about yay high and we'll have those little air vents in the bottom. And the other part that we were making, uh, just to add some context, um, so this is the back of the canopy behind the, you know, the, the cockpit area. So that's our instrument panel sticker. That other piece that I was working on. So let's see, we're going to open. Now that's that's the antenna mount, which you see here. That little box is going to go right in this area. And this SMA connector that comes off the back of the VTX is going to go up and through that mount and then our lollipop antenna is going to sit something that that should put our lollipop antenna something like this you know where this is the front of the airplane and that's the back it's going to sit right right behind the uh, right behind the pilot seat about right there and it's going to actually come up through uh, the top of the canopy, and that's okay. I don't mind that. So, um, anybody have any questions about uh, using Fusion 360 or FPV? Now, I don't want to ruin Monday's show, but Monday's show is going to be all about all the parts and things that you need to get started with FPV. So, you know, you guys can kind of get a sneak preview of uh, of what we're going to cover on Monday's show. So, are you asking if I have printed any cockpit panels, seats, gauges, or control boxes, or have I designed any? <laughs> So the, the quick answer is I have not designed anything like that. Um, and the only time that I've printed anything like that would be um, the 3D Lab Prints uh, Spitfire, uh, which I still have. It's just put away. Uh, the 3D Lab Print Spitfire... Um, you know, it has all that stuff in there. And, um, I mean, as long as your, as long as your printer is set up good, um, and it's calibrated properly and you know, the materials that you're using, you know what their melt temperature is, you know, and you're not, you're not just guessing, you know, because there's, there's some rules of, of thumb out there. If you want to, uh, you know, use, that term um, that would suggest that PLA, you know, needs to be that you need your hot end to be at like 205 degrees to 210 degrees Celsius for PLA, which is, you know, that's fine. Um, but the truth is that, you know, that temperature may not be right for that spool of PLA. You know, say that spool of PLA isn't quite 1.75 millimeters. You know, the, the filament isn't, one, isn't quite 1.75 millimeters in diameter. So, you know, there are minor uh, temperature fluctuations that are going to happen with imperfections in the filament. You know, say the filament, um, you know, isn't dry, uh, that it's got some moisture in it. Uh, say it's old and brittle or whatever. There's a lot of considerations and a lot of calibrations that you can do on your printer to really step up the print quality, where even on like a Chinese printer, uh, and I'm not knocking them, you know, most stuff is made in China. Um, you know, but there there are printers from Creality, which are the ones that I use, and there are printers, you know, from all kinds of manufacturers in China. And all the Chinese printers all kind of steal from each other anyway. And then there is, 
you, you know, like Prusa, the original Prusa printers. And those are about 700 bucks for something that's the size of an Ender 3. It's actually got a little smaller build volume. You know, but if you if you take the time to calibrate and set up and do all the things to an Ender 3, you're going to be able to get print quality out of it that that makes that $500 difference in price really seem silly. Like, why would I pay $500 more for this? As nice as it may be, is it $500 nicer than this? Uh, from a support standpoint, Probably, um, but five hundred dollars is a large disparity in price. <laughs> I I am using an Ender Three. Um, that that has been a fantastic printer for me. Um, and if anything happened to it, I would immediately buy another one. So I mean that that's a great. It's a great printer. It, it's. It is so good for the money you're paying. I mean, it's so good. It is such, it's, it's a great printer. And I think you can get them for like less than 200 bucks now. I mean, it's insane. Yeah, David, yourself, I'll tell you what. I mean, it, it, if I were to do it all over again, I would get like an Ender 3 Pro uh, because it's got the better power supply. It's got the fan on the bottom of the control cabinet. Um, you know, they got rid of, I think they got rid of the micro SD card and put a full size SD card in there. I mean, there's there's some changes that were made to the Ender 3 Pro that are worth the extra money to get the Ender 3 Pro right away. Um but once you get it and you start learning with it and you start learning how to calibrate your printer, uh, an Ender 3 Pro, uh, let me back up for a second and say all 3D printers are a nightmare. Uh, it is a machine. It is a precision machine. And you have to treat it that way, right? Like it needs fine adjustments to really get it right. Um, but once you have like the, the tramming, you know, that everything is built square, you've got the belt tensions right, you've got the extruder uh, extruder steps calibrated properly, and, and everything is done right, you're going to get quality prints out of an Ender 3 for years. I've been running mine since the Ender 3 came out, man. It's been like four or five years ago now. Um, and it's fantastic. It's, it's awesome. I use it all the time. What's up, Wild Bill? Yeah, Micro Center. I don't know if Micro Center has Ender 3s. Um, they do carry a couple of Creality products. I mean, if they've got them, yeah, absolutely go get one at Micro Center. Um, if they don't have the Ender 3, I mean, you can certainly get one on Amazon, I think, for pretty cheap, dude. <laughs> All right. So were there any other, um, yeah, 250, that's still a good deal, you know. Oh, 205.68, I mean, that, that, look, that's even better. That's even better. Um, yeah, yeah, printing pilot busts. Um, printing lady busts, <laughs> printing the Kenny bus. <laughs> yes, JB Titties. All right, so you missed the GB, but I'll go back here. Um, and show you the um, show you what we were doing. The design is already finished. 
I was just answering some, some questions before we wrap things up, but I'll show you what we made here. Um, you know, when this is all like real simple stuff, uh, this is the, it's a little mounting bracket that I made for the VTX. Uh, because the VTX, I mean, you know, those things get hot as hell. And, uh, the VTX is going to be sitting right here. So that's, that's the instrument panel. And it's like the little foam seat thing that they have inside this Dynan P47. That's where the VTX is sitting. So that little piece is going to fit right in that little slot. And then the VTX is going to drop down in there. And it's going to have those louvers in the bottom. Um that are going to help uh, get the cooling air across the heat shields and stuff uh, where that VTX is. The other part that we were uh, working on was this little piece right here. And this is a, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> All right, so this little piece right here, uh, which is going to be a mount for the SMA adapter and the antenna, uh, which comes off of the back of the VTX. Uh, that guy's gonna sit like right here and it's gonna angle that, that SMA where my antenna is you know, like the whole thing is going to sit about like that. Uh, and the antenna is going to stick out the back of the canopy. So just kind of designing parts and thought like, Hey, you know, while I'm designing parts, I may as well, yeah, kind of like when I was painting the Carmen Ghia, um, I figured I'd, I'd jump in here because I needed to make some, uh, I needed to make some parts anyway. I figured, what the hey, man, let's do a live stream. <laughs> I'll make some parts. But because I was making parts and, um, you know, there was actually people watching, I, I didn't want to, uh, like, have a bunch of interruptions. So, uh, David, yourself, I am doing a, uh, yeah, I do need a haircut, dude. Shit's getting long. <laughs> so I don't, uh, I'm doing pan only. I'm only doing pan, um, not tilt. And that's what the hole in the bottom is for. Um, I've already cut that hole to fit like a nine gram uh, servo in there. And I want to get the VTX and the antenna mounted first. And once I have those mounted, um, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I need to get the canopy on there and, and hold the camera up with like, you know, I don't know, a little set of tweezers or something. I'm going to hold the camera up where it's just kind of floating because I need to get an idea of what, what the distance is, but I'll be making another um, part that's going to glue onto a servo horn and, and, and basically be a mounting bracket for the little, you know, for the little CADEX um, camera that I've got here. It's a little CADEX ant uh, camera that's like freaking tiny. All the... All the components that I bought for this thing. And, and you know, I know that I mentioned instead of getting, you know, like an all-in-one camera with a VTX built in, I got, you know, the separate components. You know, so like the all-in-one cameras, they're usually about 30 bucks or so. Um, and you get a 25-watt, you know, 25-milliwatt VTX with like a dipole piece of crap antenna and you get a, you know, substandard camera. You know, with this one, I got um, the CADEX uh, ant camera. 
you know, which is a 1,200 TVL or, or TV lines, you know, so about 1,200 lines of resolution, even though you can't see them all. Um, I've got a 300 milliwatt VTX, all of them very small. I've got, um, uh, you know, like a, uh, what is that, UFL to SMA uh, antenna instead of a dipole antenna. And I can put like a real, you know, lollipop circular pattern antenna on the VTX so I can get much better reception. Uh, especially, you know, at longer ranges. Uh, and this gives me a little more flexibility on where I'm going to put the camera as well. So, uh, yes, Wild Bill, this is the FPV camera. Um, I mean, this is the whole setup, guys. Like, like this, this little thing in my hand, this is all of it. Like, that's the antenna the VTX, the camera, you know, like that, that little set of components, that's, that right there plugs into the battery. Done. <laughs> uh, David, yourself, I have head tracking built into my, um, my FPV goggles. So I am using the head tracking output into the trainer port. Um, and in the trainer setup, you can set it up for FPV goggles. And I've just got it, um, the head tracking running into the input of the IX12 that the servo's on. So in this case, it's running into AUX2. Um, and as I move my head uh, with the goggles on, it moves the camera. So I don't have to worry about it being on a knob. It just, it's, it's all head tracking. It just follows my head around, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Northeast FPV, that's awesome. Um, and this is... This is my first time doing FPV in an airplane. Um, so most of the, well, all of the FPV that I've done so far has been in quads. I, I, have, I have watched, you know, like tuned in to the, you know, to the channel that other people were flying airplanes on, you know, so I've been like in the goggles when other people were flying, uh, flying airplanes. But I've never flown one myself FPV. This is all, you know, a pretty new experience. And, um, you know, the P-47, uh, I am very familiar with how the airframe flies. So uh, it's, it's something that I'll be very comfortable with in the air. Um, I didn't really want to do like a high wing plane. I was like, let's just go for the glory. Uh, and this is a P-47 bubble top, um, which just seemed like a, a great candidate to throw an FPV setup in. So we're doing it. We're going balls deep. <laughs> Um, David, yourself, the canopy, let me go grab, because all I brought was like the foam section. Let me go grab the canopy too. You know, so, all right. Thank you, sir. You know, so with the tiny, tiny little VTX that I've got here, I'm going to run that down here. I don't have the servo yet, but the way all this stuff is going to mount, <laughs> you know, you've got all of that 
I mean, you've got a lot of room in there for FPV equipment. Um, and that, that antenna mount's going to go like right here, and the antenna, you know, is going to come out of the back of the canopy about like that. Right? So that's what it's going to kind of look like. The front of the canopy, I've got that drilled out. Or not drilled out, but I've cut that away. I'm also going to cut away these two side panels and possibly some back here too uh, depending on what the field of view of the camera is as I pan it hard right and hard left um, you know but as you can see I mean you've got plenty of room with that bubble top to do like anything you want so the the camera I'm assuming is gonna sit about right right here um, you know, but I want to make sure before I build the mounting bracket for that camera that again, you know, I'm measuring it out and I have the the height set right. So I'm just going to be like reaching in there with some tweezers and moving the camera around while I'm in the FPP goggles to make sure that the height looks good. I mean, I guess I could just build it and then tilt it around, tilt it up and down, but... You know, I, I kind of want to be looking over the, where like the top of the instrument panel is kind of still in the field of view. Um, but everything else, I'm like looking out over the nose of the airplane. And then as I look, you know, to the right and to the left, I can kind of see the, the leading edges of both wings. Um you know and get a more i mean i can't i can't even imagine what it's going to be like to fly like that um other than like video game <laughs> hey the patrinsic brothers what's going on guys hey really sorry to hear about uh you know y'all's business um, and I, I'm really happy at the same time to hear that you've got a lot of airplanes to continue making videos. Um, so, you know, I, I absolutely encourage, you know, you guys to keep your head up and, and keep making those airplane videos. Um, I know that I've found a lot of comfort in RC aviation here over the last month or so. So, um, yeah. Hope you guys, uh, hope you guys are, are are moving forward and and big salute from from Georgia in the United States. <laughs> so, for you guys that missed um, missed the the design process, I'm actually gonna be wrapping this. Uh, wrapping the stream up here in a minute because I need to go get my printer set up so I can start printing these fabulous new mounts that I cooked up. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and get that going. So I've got a show on Monday because on Monday... the plan is that we're going to have all of the parts and stuff printed out um, and we are going to install live. We're going to install all of the pieces and parts um, and do the first initial testing on the FPV setup and the, uh, the camera setup, the, or not the FPV, right? We're going we're gonna to set up the FPV system. We're going to set up the head tracking. We're going to set up the servo. Uh, and get all of that going on Monday, uh, you know, to just kind of cover like, hey, here's all the stuff you need to get started with first person, you know, with FPV in fixed wing. And um, I think it's probably a lot easier than most people think. Uh, I think the biggest cost barrier is getting over the fact that you're going to have to buy some goggles that aren't going to be cheap. <laughs> Or if you buy some cheap ones, expect them to suck. Um, so, that's what I got. 
I want to thank all you guys for for coming out, and thank you to Joseph Youngblood who upgraded your membership to deputy status. That's awesome. Um, that's awesome, Robert. Uh, that you guys um, that 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 Captain Blas has already found a new job. Um, and and I wish the best for you too. I mean, I'm glad that he found something, but I hope that you're also able to find something, you know, once you get the books closed, um, you know, that you're able to find something too, you know, uh, that I, I know that has to be devastating to have to close down, you know, a family business like that. That would, that would suck. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, you guys have probably survived worse, uh, especially with, you know, your hand and, and kind of seeing the progress with that. You know, uh, I mean, if there's a tougher guy out there, I don't know who it is. I think you guys are going to be all right. Um, so, Wild Bill, my goggles... I got the SkyZone 030 uh, goggles that have a 1024 by 768 OLED screens. Excellent contrast. They are, uh, you know, they also have like the built-in receiver module, diversity module. Uh, they cost $400. Um, now, in comparison, you can get a set of Fat Shark HDOs that are going to cost you $400 and you have to buy a $150 receiver and you have to buy antennas. And I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to spend about 200 more bucks. <laughs> um, but that was just for the sky zone. Oh, three O's. You can get some that have LCD panels that are going to be significantly cheaper. You can get a set of beginner box goggles. Um, Right, you can get the the box goggles for like forty bucks, but you're not going to be happy with them. I mean, they're they're grossly uncomfortable. Um, you know, the goggles is probably the one thing that you want to get as good a pair as you can afford. Um, and if all you can afford is 150 bucks, wait. <laughs> Keep saving. Uh, I'd say you want to spend, uh, I mean, it sounds crazy, but you, you really want to spend about four to 500 bucks on a pair of goggles. Do it. Spend four to 500 dollars on a set of goggles, and you will be happy, happy, happy. I mean, I've been flying line of sight for years, Wild Bill, but it's time to it's it it's time to do something a little different, man. I'm ready to jump in the pilot seat and fly that bitch for real. <laughs> So, Wild Bill, the nice thing about the ones that I got um, is all I needed was antennas. I didn't need to buy a receiver module, you know, and that's where, like, when you get into, like, the Fat Shark Dominators, the Fat Shark HDOs, HDO2s, um, they don't come with a receiver module, right? Like, you get the goggles... But they can't do anything yet. You still have to buy uh, um, a receiver module to go in them. 
which you know those prices can range between you know 50 and 150 bucks you know they're they're not cheap sorry the umx dogs are are getting some they're going crazy over here um <laughs> let's see some umx dog emojis fellas <laughs> That is so funny. Nice, nice. So, yeah, after you add it all up, Wild Bill, that's that's where the fat sharks. Um, uh, don't get me wrong, they're fantastic, great goggles. Um, I just find that you know. For my money, I found the, 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 you know, I'm always looking at that cost and performance curve, you know, and where can I get the best performance, not for the cheapest, but where my money starts to get to a point of diminishing returns where I've got excellent quality, but spending, you know, how much do I need to spend to get more? Um, and that's where I found the SkyZone 030s, um, you know, kind of meet that intersection of cost and performance and value uh, that make the most sense to me. Uh, you, you know, where you you really reach a point of diminishing returns to get more functionality and more features um you know as you move into into higher cost products you know so you've got like orca goggles which cost like an astronomical amount which are no better than the sky zones in my opinion you've got the fat shark hdo 2s which you know, arguably have better video quality. They've got some better, you know, some better functionality. But my Sky Zones have a better DVR, um, and they're still really good. You know, then you've got like the DJI's. I mean, there's when you start looking at the cost of those, when you know, with the Orcas at like six hundred and the you know, a well-equipped set of fat sharks with a nice receiver module and nice antennas, you know, that's going to cost you probably between six and seven hundred dollars, depending on if you get like the Dominator HDOs or the HDO2s. And then you get into, you know, like that that's you're in digital territory at that point. You know, so once you get into digital territory, you know, now you're talking DJI. And DJI has a lot of pros and cons. Um, you know, the DJI's look great, but there's they're not. I don't know, man. Like I don't I don't want to. I don't want to go down the DJI route yet. Um, not until they make some changes. Um, I I for now I like analogs better. So. Uh, <laughs> right northeast fpv and I, i'm i'm definitely not um uh, i am not knocking uh, you know like the fat sharks at all i look i recognize i know i know they're great um but like I said, you know, I I was looking for something specific. The 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 idea of a built-in module with diversity didn't bother me all that much, and you know they've proven to perform really well. Uh, I would absolutely recommend the Sky Zones, but I'm not gonna say that they're better than Fat Sharks, but they're really really good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and the DJIs, man, they look cool. <laughs> so, 
I don't know. I, I am sure that the more and more I get into this, the more I'm going to want to um, explore the digital side of things because, you know, having that really nice picture quality obviously is going to go a long way. But... Do I make any compromises to range? Um, you know, if I, because something else that I just got, and I mean, I'm just getting into all of this, but I'm kind of jumping in head first. Um, so I also got, I, I had a glitch one day when I was flying my, my, my new quad, and I was like, fuck it, I never want another glitch ever. So I bought Crossfire, <laughs> like immediately. I was like that day, like I'm going, I'm going and getting a, a Crossfire module right now. So I know that, you know, with a Crossfire module, I'll, I'll be able to go a lot further, but I don't need to go Crossfire for what I'm doing. Um... But someday, maybe, you know, I'll want Crossfire. So that's what I got. I got Crossfire. Um, and then I was like, well, you know, Crossfire is at least going to make it where I'm going to have the range on the radio link, you know, between the transmitter and the receiver. I'll have an excellent link and I'll have a, it'll be long. You know, I can go a few kilometers, um, you know, with Crossfire. Now, I guess something that I need to find out about or, or need to learn more about is uh, like high power, uh, possibly lower frequency or change different frequency. <laughs> Excuse me. Um high power VTX systems uh, that can match or exceed the the range capabilities of crossfire systems um, so that's that's kind of my next you know little research thing is um, what is the Functional range of 5.8 gigahertz for video transmission. And, and what do I need to go longer? So Joseph Youngblood, interesting story. In the United States, in order to operate FPV equipment, you are supposed to have a ham license. <laughs> I don't have a ham license. I'm just doing it. <laughs> ah, like they don't check my license number to buy the gear. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I probably should get a ham license just to make sure that I'm on the right side of the legal fence but um, I mean how many guys that fly FPV have a ham license is that really something that people do I just gotta know What is codeless? Oh, you have a ham license that you just give from one person to the next, depending on who's checking it that day? So, is that true as long as I'm under 25 milliwatts? 
then the license is I don't need a ham license. Because that's cool. So, yeah, I'll have to look into it. I know that the technician one is probably not very hard, and I, I, I could probably pass it with minimal study. Um, you know, I, I should probably do it just to be on the right side of the law. You know, same with the FAA bullcrap. Um, you know, because ultimately, like, depending on how much the FAA starts to crack down on all this crap, you know, the people that do it right are the people that are going to be able to still enjoy the hobby. The people that go and get their ham license, the people that get all the <laughs> what's in the box <laughs> you took months of classes I bet you did GB July you, you are Julyer <laughs> July is over. What do we got in the box? <laughs> God, they use some really strong tape. What do we have in the box? This here box came from a company named Pyrodrone in Chatsworth, California. Look at that. They sent me a battery strap, and that's all that's in the box. They sent me some air. Whew. Those air, you don't, don't bust I these. Bust don't you. bust these, as fun as that might sound right now. These motherfuckers have the Rona in them. You know what? they do. Ever. That's like bagged Rona. All right. TBS Crossfire Micro TX version 2. Which, my understanding from watching the latest TBS shits is that this here guy will someday soon be able to go up to 500 milliwatts of output power. And I think they're even trying to get it up to one watt, um, which is insane. Right? So, TBS Crossfire Micro, and, oh, did, did y'all already get to see what was in the box? The, the Radio Master TX16S. So, I'm not really, I'm not really cheating on my Spectrum radios. But, um, I got to try it out, man. I got to try it out. And this, this was a better combination for me, right? Because I was going to get the full-size Crossfire unit. Just, just kind of explain, you know, like, why are you cheating on Spectrum, Dave? But you got the IX-12, Dave. That's a way better radio. Uh, maybe it is. So, I wanted to get the full-size Crossfire unit. The full-size Crossfire unit is $208. Uh, and yes, it's got more power. It can, I think you can operate that up to 2 watts of output power. 
this guy can only go to 250 milliwatts, but for what I need, that's still going to get me way, way further than I am comfortable going. Um, this also has the ability to, I mean, it's just easy, right? So, and this, this module that will plug into the back of like a full size JR module was $70. So if you've got a radio that supports a JR module, you can get Crossfire for 70 bucks, but you don't get like the little OLED screen. You've got to do it all through like the Lewis groups and OpenTX. And with this one, not only did I get the module, I got the starter kit. So I've also got three receivers, three crossfire receivers, three sets of wires, three of the immortal, you know, whatever, the immortal T antennas in there. Like this is a crossfire starter kit, but the module itself is only 70 bucks if you buy the micro tx so at 208 dollars for the full size module and it doesn't come with any antennas or anything and this is only like 150 bucks it was the same price to get a radio master tx16s with a crossfire as it was to just get the crossfire unit. I think I saved, uh, I, I had to spend like two extra dollars, right? So for me, it made more sense to get this guy um, and have my Spectrum, you know, the iX12 will still be my go-to radio for things that are running Spectrum. Uh, maybe. I'm, I'm opening this up, guys. I'm excited. This was not supposed to be part of this stream. I want to see what they... What all they sent in here. <laughs> I got... What? Why well, was last night demonetized? What did he do last night? Was he playing music during the stream or something? So... It smells weird. I got to take... I got to take it out of the box. All right, so they give you a lot of stickers, which I never put on anything, so I will have this forever. You get this cool quick start guide. It comes in like a, a weird little foam carrying box thing. It smells funny. I'm like a kid at Christmas. Uh oh. Um, let's see, I got a USB C cable. You get like a, a key ring. That looks like a Radio Master TX16S. <laughs> so you have like a little rubber, yeah, a little rubber key ring that looks like your radio. It comes with some spare springs. I'm assuming those are for the gimbals. Maybe to change modes. They give you a little screen protector, which is nice. And here is. The radio itself, you know, with a big freaking another big color display, you know, the iX12 may be spoiled. 
Oh, it's got a ratcheting throttle. I'm going to need to freaking open this thing up and get rid of that crap because I cannot stand to have, you know, ratcheting on my throttle. But the, other than that, the, the, I mean, the gimbals feel really nice. I'll tell you what, the, I mean, this thing is like 140 bucks or something. This thing is awesome for the price. So, anyway, there'll be more to come out on this, too. Momentary switch. So all the switches are three-way, except this one's momentary. This one's two-position. All the rest are three-position, so that's cool. The sliders are really smooth. You know, I know some people think that the sliders are too loose. To me, I like the feel of the sliders on the side. They're real smooth. Um, yep, all of the uh, the trimmers feel pretty normal. The scroll wheel is nice. You know, it's like metal knurled scroll wheel. That's nice. I mean, the, you can, uh, uh, my only complaint with the pots up here is you can kind of feel uh, as you're moving the pots, the knurling on the side of the pots. They've got like a detent, which is nice. You can feel that detent real well. Uh, but the knurling on the side kind of rubs up against the casing. Um, and I don't really care for that. You've got your module, so your JR module, so that's where that TBS unit's going to pop in there. We'll pop that back on. And also your battery. So in your battery bay, you've got a carriage. Uh, you know, you've got a battery sled for two 18650 batteries, which is what I intend to use. I've got a bunch of 18650s, uh, and I'm going to be using those in here. Uh, but it is big enough to fit a pretty sizable... Um, 2S LiPo uh, res or, yeah, transmitter pack in there as well. So you've got some options and a, a fairly good battery bay. Um, up here at the top, you've got a USB-C and what looks like a trainer port, like a wired trainer port. Um, so this USB-C up here, my understanding is that you can use that USB-C uh, connection. You can plug it into the computer and you can use uh, this transmitter as a controller for simulators, um, which is awesome because, um, you know, <laughs> this is way better than what they give you with real flight. I'm just saying. Um, what else I got going on with this thing? Oh yeah, down here at the bottom, there's more more ports and stuff that are available here on the bottom. So, what do they got on the bottom? Another USB. That one is for charging. You've got an SD card. Does it come with an SD card? It comes with an SD card. Look at that. I mean, it's only 256 megabytes, but how big of an SD card do you need for something like this? That's awesome. Right? So at least it's like, you know, it's like an open TX starter pack, you know, like they give you what you need to be able to get to get started. And I mean, for the price of the radio, I mean, how big of a card can they really afford to throw in there? Um, the feel is good. It's, it's different than the iX12. 
but it's it's still comfortable, you know. Like I like how I I use my thumbs, you know. So I like how it's kind of got like these little humps in the back of the radio, these little ridges that you can kind of reach around and and grab a hold of, you know. And even when you're holding it in one hand, it feels like you've got a good grip on it. I want to do something else too, you know, because I think it needs to be done. I'm going to grab my trusty scale here because it's trusty scale time. And we're going to tear it to zero. And we're going to weigh it. So the Radio Master is 789 grams. I'm going to compare that to the IX-12. And to be fair, I should turn the IX-12 off and take the battery out. Nope. So I'm going to pull the battery out of the IX-12. Uh, TNRC, yes, that is the TX16S from Radio Master. All right. I'm going to pull the battery out of the IX12. We're going to put it on the scale. Because I tell you, the Radio Master feels for it feels good. It feels like a solid radio. Um, like I said, it's seven hundred eighty nine grams. You know, the IX twelve feels like a solid radio as well. I'm gonna put this on the scale. Radio Master was 789 grams. The IX-12 is 714 grams. So there's a, a small weight difference. The, the IX-12 is actually a little bit lighter than the Radio Master. Um, So yeah, this is a solid feeling. This is a solid feeling radio. And it doesn't feel, you know, like I'm sitting here shaking the crap out of it other than the, you know, the gimbal moving around, which I kind of expect the gimbals to move around a little bit. I mean, it, this just feels like a solid piece. Um I'm surprised, you know, being having been a spectrum guy and still am, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to give up my uh, my IX-12, but, uh, you know, having used Spectrum for years um, and, and never really being all that impressed with, with the FR Sky, like the Tyrannus radios always just seemed aged to me. You know, when, when FR Sky started making the Tyrannus, they were already using the mold of a radio that was five or six years old, you know, and this was like 10 years ago that they started making like the Tyrannus X9D with a radio mold that was already five or 10 years old anyway, you know, so when the X9D came out, it just looks like an old junky radio to me. I know they're not, um, 
but they just have that appearance of an old school radio. And I wanted something a little more modern. It, and the FR Sky modern designs to me look like ass, you know. So like the X7 and the the um, or the Q Q7X is it? The Horus designs. The the Horus looks like ass with all those weird angles, um, you know. And that's where I think like Jumper and and Radio Master, you know, kind of went with that more of like a Futaba style, um, and they they really did a good job, and uh, you know, coming from being a long time Spectrum user and feeling this compared to like an X9D, uh, I think this is a much better looking radio, just from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, and it feels better in the hands. It's got a better, you know, ergonomic feel to it. I really like this thing. I'm, I'm happy. That, that seems like 130 bucks or 140 bucks well spent. This thing is so cost effective that, and they're kind of, because they're so new and so fresh. As long as I leave everything on it, you know, and I wipe it off real good, even if I hate it, I could probably turn around and sell it with the Crossfire unit because these are out of stock everywhere. I could probably sell it for the same amount that I paid for it and lose nothing. So I'm really, I'm really surprised with how well it feels. Anyway, uh, sorry that this kind of turned into a, uh, you know, like this crazy impromptu unboxing initial impressions. I mean, I haven't even turned it on yet, but the, um, I, I just had to, man. I got it out of the box and was, I got to, uh, you can't do that. You, you can't like get a box of stuff while you're on the air talking to people about RC stuff and get a box with a new transmitter in it and not take it out? I couldn't take it out. I had to. <laughs> I had to take it out. But, uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty surprised. So, you know, I've got some, some time that I'm going to use to, um, you know, to, to learn up open tx um and and get this you know get one of the crossfire receivers wired up into my quad um because that's what i got it for and uh we're gonna try that out man so far though it feels great so for those of you guys that are looking for uh you know, for something like that, you know, like what should I get? And and I'll I'll add this too. So yes, they're for people that are on the fence, like uh, that maybe want to try an Open TX radio, and they see the Radio Masters and they see the jumpers, uh, like the T eighteen. <laughs> I had to open the box, man. I had to open the box. Um, yes, the Radio Master does not have ribbon cables. I have seen one opened up, um, and there are no ribbon cables. The only ribbon cable in the Radio Master, and I think in the new Jumper T18s as well, is there is a ribbon cable that uh, attaches to the LCD screen, which is kind of expected. Um, everything else is standard, you know, wire um like wire jumper cables with, uh, you know, uh, JST, PHXH connect. I mean, they're, they're standard, um, you know, connectors in there, which is nice to see uh, with all the problems that they had with the um, ribbon cables with the, the, the T16 and T16 Pros initially uh, with jumper. Um, even the new T18 and, and certainly the Radio Master are not using ribbon cables anymore. 
so uh, yeah, for me, I, I was on the fence. You know, I was like, I want to try out one of these uh, new OpenTX radios. And when the Radio Master came out, the the Radio Master still has like the four in one module. This is closer to like a really upgrade, like an upgraded version of the T16 Pro. Uh, I don't know. I mean, even like the T18. I think that they're very comparable with each other uh, because this one already has a touchscreen in it. That's true. So one of the biggest differences between the jumper and the radio master. So the T18 and the T16S, TX16S radio master is that the radio master only has a four in one module, right? So it can do like all of your 2.4 gigahertz multi-module stuff. Um, but it does not have built in 900 megahertz, which the, the jumper T18 and the T18 pro, the T18 Lite just has the multi-module. The T18 and the T18 pro have a built in 900 megahertz module. That's compatible with FR sky R9. Um, in the research that I have done, um, Everything would suggest to me that that between the two, if you have the option of going with Crossfire, get Crossfire. If you have, you know, if all you have is FR Sky, get R9. Um, but with this kit, you know, where you can start where you can get the whole thing for like 200 bucks. When I look at the price of like the T18 Pro, which I think is like 189, for 20 more dollars, I can go with a Radio Master and a Crossfire unit that has in my opinion, I would rather run Crossfire than the FR Sky R9. Um, and it's not like a compatible module. Like, this is the real deal. Like, this is Team Black Sheep Crossfire all the way. So, I mean, it was kind of a no-brainer. The Radio Master just makes it easy for you. Like, you also want 900 megahertz? Hey, get the Radio Master. They've got a package that Radio Master has put together with with Team Black Sheep. Um, and I think it's called like the Radio Master, you know, uh, Master Fire Edition or something like that. That is this radio with this included. They didn't have that in stock, so I had to buy them separate, right? Uh, still not a big deal. But yeah, that Master Fire Edition comes with a Crossfire Micro TX receiver or, or transmitter module, which I think is fantastic. So, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, I talk a lot about, like, where do I want to spend my money and what do I want to spend it on? Um, because I think it's important, like, you know, not to... I mean, I guess to some degree as a, you know, reviewer... I should try everything, but I'm also not, uh, like really what I'm doing is I'm just sharing my journey, right? Um, and, and part of my journey is doing the product research and finding out what's out there and trying to figure out what that point of diminishing returns is, kind of like we were talking with, uh, um, with the FPV goggles. I want... A product, you know, nobody sends me this stuff. This I pay for it. <laughs> so, um, I want a product that's going to give me the most, well, not necessarily the cheapest and not necessarily the most expensive, is going to give me the best experience that I can get for the money that I'm paying. Um, and that's, you know, deciding between the jumper and the radio master. Uh, through that research and whatever and if I was going to use 900 megahertz do I want FR Sky or do I want Crossfire and you know like the 
the, the, you, you see where I spent my money. Radio Master and Crossfire was where I went with that. And time will tell if I made the right choice. Um, the reactions of some people that know a lot more about this than I do would suggest that I absolutely made the right decision. So, Kenny will be all right. Uh, Kenny already knows that I got it, dude. <laughs> Why, Bill? What are you? Uh, what are you waiting on from Horizon? Little bit of little bit of monster on a Saturday. Mm. Oh, the E Flight Evolution. I didn't know they were still selling that. Alright. Anyway, I I was gonna get off of here at like two o'clock, and here it is two thirty where I've just been blabbing about this radio that I haven't even turned on. I'm super excited, you know, to have this thing. Um we're we're definitely gonna be talking about all of this stuff. Like, I'm, I'm like stupid happy. I'm stupid happy about a new transmitter. The Radio Master TX16S. So, I'm glad it got here while I was streaming. I'm glad that I got to kind of show you guys a sneak preview. Um, <laughs> T and Scoot, that's funny. Put the money you pay for them and lay them on the scale. <laughs> now, Joseph Youngblood, I, I saw that what you were saying is Dave got demonetized due to saying a troll's name. I <laughs> mean, that sucks. <laughs> Call him out, man. Um... Anyway, guys, thank you all for, for showing up um, and, you know, uh, for the first hour of this, um, you know, going on my little, you know, journey while I was designing these parts where I've got, you know, this little mount um, for my VTX. Uh, that's going in my P47. I made this little mount to, you know, add some louvers under there for wind and heat dissipation. And also, uh, this little mount for the antenna that my SMA connector is going to go into. And it, although it looks basic, and it, and it is, uh, here on this side, um, you know, it's got a little area with a recessed uh, hex area that uh, the SMA connector, the, the UFL to SMA adapter will slide up in there and you can kind of torque it down a little bit. Um, so yeah, thanks for hanging out with me while I designed those. And then we got a surprise visit from the freaking mailman uh, delivering the new jumper or shit, the new Radio Master TX16S and you know, some TBS Crossfire Micro TX starter kit. I'm super excited. I can't wait to share this stuff with you guys in videos. But, you know, I had to give you my first impressions. So thanks for hanging out. Thank you guys all for, uh, you know, spending a little bit of your Saturday afternoon with me. I'm going to go and get my printer bed cleaned up and start printing these parts uh, while I do the initial setup on this Radio Master Ray Didymo. Um, actually, no, I got to charge up some 18650 batteries first. So that will also be delayed. God. Battery charging. <laughs> Freaking America. Anyway. Um, UMX Dog It Up, if you're members. 
<laughs> Thank you guys for coming out. We will see you all tonight in the Pilot's Lounge, tomorrow in the Merry Boozer Channel. But I will be seeing you again with my crazy pretty face on camera this coming Monday for Air Marshal Mondays. And uh, everybody have a great weekend. Get out and fly something. It's National Fly a Plane Day, but it's raining here in Georgia. So, yeah. Anyway, have a good day, guys. We will see all y'all later.